God, we thank you for the opportunity again to come before you and worship, to join our songs together in a preview of eternal praise to you. We gather as well to hear from your word, and we pray this morning by the power of your spirit to be altered by it, to have our thinking brought into conformity with the way you see the world. We pray this morning that you would help us to see our world rightly and to see ourselves rightly and our place in it. And we ask this for your glory in Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated, but I invite you to turn in your Bibles again this morning to Romans chapter 8. Last week, as we looked at Romans 8.18, we were discussing Christian suffering and the glory that is not even worthy to be compared. And you need to know something about your suffering, Christian. You're not alone in it. The world around you itself suffers. And that's what we're going to talk about this morning. Our text is Romans 8, 19 to 25. We're going to be looking at the suffering of this world. Our world is governed by what physicists call the second law of thermodynamics. That is, in a closed system, things break down. Everything is in a a set of operating principles whereby order gives way to chaos in progressive entropy. Organized things tend to revert to disorganization. You know that the life expectancy of a brand new automobile off the assembly line is eight years. You just thought about how much you paid for the car. I used some stainless steel screws on a project in my backyard a number of years ago in the house that we currently live in, so these had to have been placed in the yard less than 10 years ago. And there is no stainless steel screw left, but in the dirt I found a rusted imprint of a stainless steel screw. Your body is breaking down, stuff falls apart, pipes burst in the middle of the front yard, pipes that were buried to carry waste from your home to the city sewer system, they should have been in the ground and stayed intact for a long time yet to come, and they burst and flood your yard. Termites take the materials of your home in order to build their own homes, And while we might laud their opportunistic endeavors at recycling, I was still using that material. (laughs) Dishwashers, stop dishwashing. Refrigerators, stop refrigerating. On Friday of this week, a 7.0 earthquake near the town that I grew up in broke roads and smashed dishes and reminded Alaska residents of the 9.2 that hit Anchorage in 1964 and still bears its marks on that city. Some of you lived through the 6.7 earthquake in Northridge in 1994. Our world is plagued by tsunamis, wildfires, floods, mudslides, volcanoes, tornadoes, hurricanes. These things destroy property, they upend lives. At times, our physical world is violent, convulsing unpredictably. And no matter of money brings escape from the tumultuous realities of living in this world. No geography is a protection. We, I mean, Arizona, we live in something of a natural disaster-free zone. We get dirt clouds from time to time. But things in this tumultuous world can strike anywhere, anybody, anytime. In 1954, on November 30th, a meteorite struck an Alabama woman. She's the only person in modern recorded history to be a verified target of a rock from outer space. It didn't kill her. It crashed through her roof, bounced off her radio, and hit her in the leg, leaving a large bruise. She became famous. She ended up in a long lawsuit over the possession of the rock that hit her from outer space. (laughs) 
In the 1970s, we were all worried about a coming ice age. In the last decade, we've all been worried about global warming. And I read an article just last week that said we're headed for another ice age. Whatever the reality is about where our climate might go, the truth is creation is groaning like a woman about to give birth in labor pains. And human beings cannot fix what is fundamentally wrong with the world around us, though we do bear responsibility. We don't bear responsibility for the state of our tumultuous universe or the second law of thermodynamics because of pollution. We bear responsibility for something much deeper and much darker than what we do with our trash. Humanity is responsible for the state of the world because humanity is intimately tied to God's created universe. Animal predation is another element of this corrupt order. Animals kill and eat each other. And some of you sent me videos this week of animals eating animals who were eating other animals. Terrifying. A couple of years ago, I visited a wild animal park in South Africa, and the week before I was there, a woman was pulled through a very small opening in her window, breaking all the bones in her body by a lion who reached into her car and pulled her out through that small opening, devoured her. Just this week, a driver in Thailand inadvertently drove his car into the back legs of an elephant. The elephant was enraged, turned around, and stomped on the car and killed the driver. You and I need the light of the sun, heat and warmth and photosynthesis and food production and all the rest, and yet too much time in the sun will kill you. We depend upon oxygen, and yet oxygen can be very dangerous because it lowers the temperature at which other things burn. You put the wrong kinds of things together with a lot of oxygen, and things blow up. Filling a blimp with hydrogen gas seemed to be a great plan for luxury air travel until the Hindenburg blew up. The very chemistry on which we depend for daily life can be volatile and dangerous. There is suffering everywhere. People suffer. Nature suffers. Animals suffer. Architecture suffers. Machines suffer. The dog bites, the bee stings, and we feel bad. Why is our world like this? The world is groaning and straining. And it is straining under the curse of God. You see, the physical universe knows something that we humans want to deny. Something that humanity in large part has fundamentally forgotten. And it is this, creation will never work properly until the curse of God on creation is lifted. And the curse on creation will not be lifted until God has glorified his children. That is the point of our passage this morning. And Christians know this. The children of God know this. We ought to know this better. We ought to sink our faith into this truth. According to Romans 8, 19, the created universe knows it too. Sometimes knows it better than we do. Let's read together Romans 8, 19 to 25. God writes through the Apostle Paul an explanation of why our world looks and acts the way it does. For the anxious longing of the creation waits eagerly for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope. Because the creation itself also will be set free from its slavery to corruption into the freedom of the glory of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation groans and suffers the pains of childbirth together until now. And not only this, but also we ourselves, having the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves groan within ourselves, waiting eagerly for our adoption as sons, the redemption of our body. For in hope we have been saved, but hope that is seen is not hope. For what hopes for what he, who hopes for what he already sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, with perseverance we wait eagerly for it. 
This passage this morning is going to detail for us the eager anticipation of the created universe for the glorification of Christians. And secondly, this passage is going to detail for us the eager anticipation embedded within the heart of the Christian by the indwelling Holy Spirit for the glorification of Christians. In other words, the universe looks forward to you and me looking like Jesus, and you and I are to look forward to that same reality. The future glory of the children of God is immeasurably greater than present suffering. That's what we looked at last week, verse 18. This immeasurably greater glory is worth waiting for. That's what we're looking at this morning. How good is future glory for the Christian? So good that the universe eagerly waits for it. The universe itself is looking forward to that glory. The first half of our passage today can be summarized this way. Creation eagerly anticipates future glory. This is a summary of verses 19 to 22. And in verse 19, we're introduced to this with this statement. For the anxious longing of the creation waits eagerly for the revealing of the sons of God. And by creation here, Paul means the non-human universe. The the physical universe around us. And, And here... Paul personifies creation, personifies creation. He gives creation desires and a will and awareness and knowledge. It's a a rhetorical device. It's a a literary device. Paul is not saying here uh, that dolphins think about your resemblance to Jesus. He's not not, uh, intending for us to understand uh, a fundamental nature of granite, is that granite is thinking and desiring and willing. But he is saying that the created universe, both in animated things, that is animal life, and in inanimate things, plant life and rocks and everything in between, is personified here to put on display God's design for the created world and God's design for humanity. That is the point of this device. And the scriptures personify creation a number of different times. In Psalm 65, 12, the pastures of the wilderness drip and the hills gird themselves with rejoicing. Right? That's personification of nature. Isaiah 24, 4, the earth mourns and withers, the world fades and withers. Jeremiah 4, 28, for this earth shall mourn and the heavens above be dark. Jeremiah 12, 4, how long is the land to mourn and the vegetation of the countryside to wither? And Isaiah 55, 12, the trees of the field will clap their hands. Trees don't have hands. Can they clap? Are they singing? The personification of nature is a device used throughout Scripture to tell us something of the purpose of the created order. And in this case, here in Romans 8, 19, The subject of the sentence is the eager expectation of creation. The eager expectation. And this is a fascinating word. It's a combination of three words together, uh, something like the head stretched away from the body. The head stretched away from the body. The idea here is some long-necked animal craning its neck around the corner, peering around the bend to see what is coming. That is, creation itself is is said to be sort of on its tiptoes. Think of an offensive lineman in a running play in football. The running back is aiming to run through the hole in the defense that the lineman is supposed to create. So what is the lineman doing as the snap count is happening? He's on his toes. He's in his stance. He's anticipating. He's ready. He's ready to go, ready to explode and create the hole. He is like a coiled spring. This is a confident eager anticipation and expectation. And this is how Paul describes the universe, waiting in eager expectation. When I was a kid, I remember trying to detect a freight train coming. You know, you find a, I'm not recommending this procedure. (laughs) Found a set of railroad tracks. I wonder when a train's coming. And And like in the Old West movies, you get down on that and you put your ear next to the rail and you try to feel and listen for the train coming. That's when you don't want somebody to sneak up behind you and scare you. 
kids, don't play on the train tracks. But eagerly anticipating something that I'm looking forward to, can I detect it yet? Is it coming? Is it right around the bend? And what is it that creation is so eagerly waiting for? According to verse 19, it is the revealing, the apocalypse of, the, 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 the bringing to light of the children of God. Creation longs for the revealing of the children of God. And you think, well, wait a second. Aren't I a child of God already? Yes. Yes. If you are a believer in Jesus Christ, you are adopted into God's family, and you already have the status that that adoption brings. But you do not yet have the fullness of the benefits that that adoption guarantees. You do not yet possess the inheritance that God has promised and purchased for you. And you do not yet manifest the glory that you yourself will have in glory with him. And that revealing of the children of God, that manifesting of who the children of God actually are and what they are like is yet to come. 1 John 3, 2 says it this way, Beloved, now we are children of God, but it has not yet appeared as what we will be. And we know that when he appears, we will be like him because we will see him just as he is. We talked about that last week when, when we were in the very presence, the glorious refulgence of God himself, that glory that's intrinsic to God, the sum total of his attributes radiating out in beautiful excellencies. When we're in that presence, we actually become transformed to resemble that glory as far as it's possible for finite creatures to resemble the glory of God. It's what we were made for. It's what you've been redeemed for, Christian. And it is right now concealed and will one day be revealed. Paul says this in Colossians 3. You have died, Christian, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. And when Christ, who is our life, is revealed, then you also will be revealed with him in glory. And you and I look forward to that. And so do the dolphins, and so does the broccoli, and so do the quasars and the pulsars, and every atom in this universe. Why does the created universe so look forward to the day when redeemed humanity is glorified? Well... If we continue with the personification, it's sort of selfish. Right now, the universe is frustrated. It's frustrated. Look at verse 20. Why does the anxious longing of the creation wait eagerly for the revealing of the sons of God? Verse 20, because the creation was subjected to futility. That is, the, the entire physical universe was placed under something. What, what was that something it was placed under? Subjected underneath. Futility. Futility. That is the, the, the hamster wheel. The, the going after the same things all the time, hoping to get a different result, never getting a different result. Subjected to the second law of thermodynamics. Subjected to entropy. Subjected to stainless steel rusting and things falling apart. And this word futility is a, is a critical word. It's only used a few times in the New Testament, and, and, and it's used 47 times in the Old Testament. 32 of those times is in one book. You want to guess which book this word shows up in? 32 times. Almost all of its uses in the whole Bible. Ecclesiastes. Ecclesiastes. This word for futility translated here is the word that translated the, the, the word hevel. We looked at that when we studied through the book of Ecclesiastes. Ecclesiastes 1.1, 1, 1, the, the preacher says, vanity of vanities. Futility of futilities. Some have said, have translated the word meaninglessness. But I think futility is the right word. God has placed the created order and subjected it under futility. That is, it spins and spins and goes round and round and does all the things the created order does, and yet things don't satisfy. Things fall apart. Things can't bring you the kind of eternal satisfaction that they were designed to do. 
In fact, Ecclesiastes is, is Solomon's sermon reflecting on the curse that takes us all the way back to Genesis. The, the creation doesn't work correctly because man sinned and God cursed the world as a result. And so the world doesn't work correctly because it cannot work correctly. And what a travesty it is when, when people who don't know God try to rethink the situation of the world. You and I look around at the world and we say, man, this stuff is broken. And the prevailing scientific theory of the moment says, oh, this is the best it's ever been. It's been progressing from chaos to order. And look, look how it has evolved. And it's getting better and better and better. What a misinterpretation of the world around us. It's not based on empirical evidence. It's not based on any observable data. That theory is a projection backwards into things we can't test, can't see, can't observe, based on assumptions that are contrary to the very things we can observe. And the reality is this subjection to futility, this second law of thermodynamics and entropy that brings things from an orderly fashion to a disorderly one is prevalent. It is the way the universe operates. And it does so not just in the physical world, but also in the philosophical one. Think about the way that we live. If you don't know Christ, if you don't have a personal relationship to God, you're, you're bound to this world in some significant ways. You're bound to the way the world operates. You're bound to the things the world goes after. You, from your own heart, love and hate the things according to the ways of this world. And, and you try to seek identity, purpose, satisfaction, fulfillment, fun, enjoyment, pleasure, in what Solomon calls in Ecclesiastes, the things under the sun. And the things under the sun have been programmed by God to not yield the satisfaction you're looking for. Can't give the pleasure you seek, can't provide the fun you want. And like the drug user who needs a bigger hit of the same thing to get the same level of enjoyment he had before from the first hit, you and I try to squeeze out of this world more enjoyment and the world will not yield it because the world cannot yield it. God has subjected this universe to futility ever since the fall of man under his curse so that we will not limit ourselves to finding enjoyment, satisfaction, and fulfillment under the sun, but that we'll look up and find out the reason for which we were actually made and seek our enjoyment, identity, purpose, fulfillment, pleasure, fun in him. And one of the things the Christian discovers in a personal relationship to God, the creator and sustainer of all things, is that you don't get the toys in the toy shop, you get the toy maker as your dad. And you get the source of all delight as the one who loves you and rescues you from this present, broken, falling apart order. And the tragedy of us as Christians, when we get squeezed into the thinking of the world around us, and we forget to have our thoughts shaped by God's thoughts, is we forget what the universe knows. And we, we once again look under the sun for things that could bring us happiness, joy, pleasure, delight, fun, fulfillment, identity. The Christian has been redeemed for much bigger things than this. And the world around us knows it. Notice what Paul says about the created order. It was subjected to futility, verse 20, not willingly. In other words, um, grizzly bears did not of their own accord come up with the idea of eating people. Rust did not just invent itself. This was not willingly by the created order, but because of him who subjected it. Most of your English translations capitalize him for a good reason. It's God who subjected the created order to this futility. 
this goes back to Ecclesiastes. Ecclesiastes 7.13 says this, Consider the work of God. Who is able to straighten what God has bent? The universe is bent, and God gets the credit. And this takes us back to Genesis chapter 3. I want you to turn your Bibles to Genesis 3. The first two pages of your Bible are great and wonderful. The last two pages of your Bible are perfect. And everything in between is the story of sin. The Bible, by the way, is a perfect, accurate record of the tragedy of human sin. But from Genesis 3 on, all the way to Revelation chapter 20, the, the majority of your Bible describes the results and then the hope built into Genesis chapter 3. So Genesis 3, you know that Adam and Eve rebelled against God, sinned against God, and then God cursed the world. In verse 14, the curse begins with the serpent. Satan, who took on a physical form in the form of a snake, God speaks to, this, to Satan. He says, because you have done this, that is, enticed Adam and Eve to rebel against their maker, cursed are you more than all cattle and more than every beast of the field. On your belly you will go, dust you will eat all the days of your life. The first element of the curse affects the created order so that snakes, originally created good, because Satan took on the form of a snake in order to entice Adam and Eve, um, are now cursed. You see that the created order from the very beginning is affected by sin's entrance into the world and affected by God's curse on creation. He says in verse 15, I will put enmity between you, Satan, and the woman, between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise you on the head and you shall bruise him on the heel. Listen, this curse in Genesis 3.15 has embedded in it Hope, hope. God makes a promise to Satan that the woman's going to have seed, descendants, and then he changes it to singular. The singular descendant of the woman will crush your head, Satan. And, and you'll crush his heel, but he'll crush your head. See, from the very beginning, the curse of God comes with it, hope. And the other elements of the curse, likewise, have consequences of sin and hope from God. To the woman, he said, I will greatly multiply your pain in childbirth. In pain, you will bring forth children. Um, curse, because now childbearing, which Adam and Eve were uh, equipped and prepared and commanded to do before the fall, now will come with suffering. But it will come. Do you hear the hope in that? Um, on the day you eat of the fruit, you shall surely die. Wait, death for sin Yes, Adam and Eve died spiritually. They began a decay process of physical death immediately upon sinning, and they eventually died physically. And yet there's life. Adam even calls his wife's name Eve, the mother of all the living. Could have called her a lot of things. He called her the mother of the living. And God promised that she would have descendants, life out of death. And notice this hope. Your desire will be for your husband, and he will rule over you. In other words, you're still going to like him and, and want to be near him. Only two human beings on the earth, and after the curse, they could have gone their separate ways. Procreation over. And, and yet there's hope. And then in verse 16 to the, or verse 17, to Adam, to the man, he said, "Because you've listened to the voice of your wife and you've eaten from the tree about which I commanded you saying, "You shall not eat from it, cursed is the ground because of you. In toil you will eat of it all the days of your life. Uh, by the sweat of your face you will eke out bread from the ground. It's a curse. And hope. You're going to get food. There are going to be thorns, there are going to be thistles. In fact, the, the very ground that you are to toil, by the way, Adam's name comes from the word for dirt, and the dirt was to serve Adam in companionship under the rulership of God, and now the dirt is rebelling against the man called dirt. 
and yet he will still eat. You will eat, verse 18, the plants of the field. By the sweat of your face, you'll eat bread until you return to the dirt. For from the dirt you were taken, and to the dirt you'll return. Your name is dirt, you came from dirt, you'll eat out of the dirt, but you'll live. There's hope. And Paul's commentary here in, in Romans 8 on the condition of our present universe is an expansion of the bent universe described in Ecclesiastes 7.13, the vanity of vanities or the futility described in the entirety of the book of Ecclesiastes, all taking us back to the curse in Genesis 3. You see, the condition of the universe is inexorably tied to the condition of humanity. The universe's condition is tied to our condition, and the universe's destiny is tied to our destiny. And this goes all the way back to the beginning. Listen to Genesis 1.26. When God in Trinitarian fellowship is discussing the creation of man, he says this, let us make man in our image according to our likeness and let them rule over the fish of the sea the birds of the sky, over the cattle, and over all the earth, over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. God created man in his own image, and the image of God he created, and male and female he created them. God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and subdue it. The Hebrew word is kabosh. They were to put the kabosh on the created order. And to rule over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the sky and over every living thing that moves on the earth. Do you understand that before the fall, man was created as God's sub-regent, as kings of the earth, that, that man and woman created in God's image were to multiply, fill the earth, and subdue it, and rule over everything as a selfless, loving, sacrificial stewardship of lordship under God over the created order. Man was to be Lord of the universe, Lord over the earth, Lord over the created things. He was to have mastery over the created order. And it was to be good. It was to be a faithful, selfless stewardship. It was, in fact, to reflect God's character. This is why man is made in the imprint and the image of God to be a reflector of God over God's created order. This, what, this is what man was made for, and this is what the earth was created for. The environmentalists get it wrong when they tell us that the earth is really angry with us and can't wait to be rid of humans. Just the opposite. The creation is groaning under, yes, our foul stewardship, our selfish stewardship, but groaning fundamentally because the image of God in man that man was created to reflect and fill the earth with has been marred nearly beyond all recognition because of sin and the fall. And it is not until man once again resembles his maker in all of the love and selflessness, in all of the beauty and excellencies of the glory of God, that creation will one day again be what it was supposed to be. Until then, it's broken. When creation's Lord is corrupt, morally bankrupt, then the creation itself is set against man in rebellion, in rebellion against his talents, his energies, his enterprising endeavors. Listen, it doesn't take much for the earth to wipe a town off the map. We name our hurricanes, we personify these things, Katrina, Andrew, Michael, Carla, Wilma, Harvey, Irma, Maria, that remove whole swaths of human population off the earth, destroying property and lives. A fire sweeps through a whole town in California, or a tsunami wipes off village after village after village in coastal countries. Verse 20 concludes with a little phrase, in hope, in hope. The English translations uh, take this phrase differently. Uh, some tie it to verse 21. Uh, the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it. Verse 21, in hope that the creation itself also will be set free. 
and some tie it to verse 20, that God subjected the creation in hope, in hope. And, and verse 21, the first word there, that should be taken as a because. I take it that way, that God subjected the created order in hope. That takes us all the way back to Genesis three fifteen to 18. From the very beginning, there was hope under the curse. God set it up this way. Because, verse 21, what, what is the hope that the creation looks forward to? When the curse is lifted, when the curse is over, the creation itself, verse 21, also will be set free from its slavery to corruption into freedom. From the very beginning of history, the universe has known that this is not the way it is supposed to be. And that as soon as the children of God are revealed in glory, then, verse 21, the creation itself will also be set free from its slavery to corruption. And think about that phrase, a slavery to entropy. A slavery to falling apart. A slavery to disorder and chaos. A slavery to random disassembly. The universe has not been allowed to look right, act right, Physics is broken, chemistry is broken, biology is broken. The operating principles that govern our universe now are under the very curse of God. We're enslaved to entropy. We're slaves of the second law. We're resigned to rust. And chemically, at the, at the atomic level, at the subatomic level, everything is given to instability. I mean, why can't you just build something and it stay built? Why can't you fix something and it stay fixed? Parts wear out. And this slavery to corruption one day will give way to freedom. And notice what God calls this freedom. It is the freedom of the glory of the children of God. Now, this chain of descriptions indicates very clearly that what creation's future is tied to is Christian's glory. That is, you're being brought into conformity with the glory of the resurrected Jesus Christ. This is what you were rescued unto. This is what is guaranteed you if you are in Christ. It's what you were predestined for, as we'll find out later in chapter 8. And the glory of the children of God means freedom for the creation. Can you imagine what a freed universe will be like when it's no longer a slave to corruption, when it's no longer trapped by the principle of breaking down into disorder? The destiny of creation is tied to the destiny of redeemed humanity. Just as we learn, just as we learn in Romans 5 that all of humanity is in solidarity with Adam because of sin since the fall, we also learn that creation itself is in solidarity with Adam and with us ever since the fall. Except for perhaps a few days in creation's history, creation has never known what it's like to be free. And just as a new solidarity with Christ means that redeemed humanity will be what it should be, so also the creation can finally be what it was intended to be when redeemed humanity is fully and finally glorified. What will it look like for the universe when the image bearers of God actually live up to that image? And when they rule and govern and administrate and create and design and build with the materials in the created universe and stuff doesn't break down? Can you imagine? Look at verse 22. For we know that the whole creation groans and suffers the pains of childbirth together until now. Groans together. The whole creation groans together. That is, the universe is seen here, as one uh, Bible translator put it, as a symphony of sighs. All of creation sighing together in symphony. And then the second description, suffering together in labor pains. Uh, the universe is depicted here as a, a woman in childbirth. Uh, what, what, what is a woman thinking about in childbirth? You don't have to fill in that gap. I, I imagine 
hopeful anticipation and unimaginable discomfort, and I have to imagine it. But, but there's anticipation locked with discomfort. And, and, and I'm not intending to minimize labor by using discomfort. Pain, extreme pain, agony. But this is how God depicts the created order. Groaning and suffering as in labor pains. In other words, looking forward to something, looking forward to children, and in agony at the same time. The second half of our passage deals not with creation's eager anticipation, but with Christians eagerly anticipating future glory. And you'll see some of the same elements here. The same kind of groaning, creation groans and we groan, and hope. The creation subjected to futility in hope, and we have hope. Look what Paul says in verse 23. Not only this, but also we ourselves groan. We groan too. The same word. Christians feel the same internal strain that the universe is said to feel. You and I as believers in Jesus Christ, being made citizens of heaven already, being adopted into God's family already, being declared righteous already by His grace through faith, we feel homeless, listless, pilgrims. It's like we're camping. This isn't home. Our body is called a tent which will be torn down so that we have a home built not with hands but made for us in heaven by God. There is a longing in us, and, and in a sense we are in travail like a woman in labor, longing, eagerly anticipating, groaning within ourselves our own glorification. And why do we feel this way? Verse 23, because we have the first fruits of the Spirit. Paul says we have the first fruits of the Spirit. Uh, the first fruit was that which was brought in at the beginning of the harvest, and it was the, the first things that, that the first heads of grain that were plucked, the, the first grapes off of the vine, the, the first fruits from the grapefruit tree, or whatever it is. And, and you realize, oh, this first one, this is a foretaste of things to come. The whole tree is going to provide grapefruits for the next several months, and I can't wait. And, and the Holy Spirit here, indwelling a believer, is said to be something like a first fruit, it, it's a down payment on eternity. It's the first taste of what is to come in full measure in the future. The indwelling Holy Spirit is a perpetual reminder for believers while in this world that this present state is not right, that this world is not my home, that heaven is home. The Christian does not have all his eggs in the basket of this present life. No, the Christian is one who has doubled down on eternity, doubled down on the next life. Double down on glory. Think about the cost of discipleship when, when Jesus presented the good news. Die. You can't have the kingdom unless you take up your cross and follow me. You're not worthy of the kingdom unless you're willing to die. In fact, to become a Christian is to die in union with Christ, to be buried with him and raised again to new life. You can't be a Christian and you can't be guaranteed of eternity unless you die to yourself. And so the Christian is one who has wagered everything to gain heaven, given up everything to have Christ, to have a home with God, to inherit the glory of eternity in his presence. That's what it means to be a Christian. And notice verse 23, we ourselves groan within ourselves. Notice how many times... In one verse, Paul says, we and ourselves, over and over and over again. It's because this is real, experiential, feeling, subjective impressions about our union with Christ, the indwelling spirit, and our discomfort in this broken world. This is what we experience. And he says, we are waiting eagerly for our adoption. Wait, I... Haven't we talked about this already? Aren't I already adopted? <laughs> yes, we have adoption as a current status. This is what 1 John told us. Even now we are children of God, but we don't yet know what we will be. 
That truth is here too. We have the current status of adoption, and yet we are yet to obtain the full and lasting benefits of our inheritance. And that adoption here is defined in verse 23 as the redemption of our bodies. That is, resurrection. And maybe as homework this afternoon, you can read 1 Corinthians 15 and look at what that resurrection is like. We are buried mortal, earthy, weak, natural, and raised eternal, powerful, spiritual, supernatural, heavenly. There's a day coming when you, Christian, will be united to a new physicality in a resurrection body that is like Jesus' powerful, supernatural resurrection body. Very physical, very real, very tangible, and yet supernatural, eternal, unable to fall apart, not subject to sickness. You will never again get a cold. You will never again feel weakness. Isaiah says we will run and not grow weary. What will that be like? It is what we have to look forward to. The redemption of our bodies. If even the curse on creation that has defined world history came with hope, how much more our salvation? And look at verses 24 and 25. Our salvation comes with hope. Not only the down payment of the Spirit indwelling us, not only the promise of the future, but real hope even now. Verse 24, for in hope we have been saved. Now we have to get out of our sort of American definition of hope and get into the New Testament's definition of hope. Right? We we use hope all the wrong ways. We say, uh, oh, I really hope I get that... Uh, remote control airplane for Christmas. That was, that was not a hint. <laughs> it's like wishful thinking. Um, that's not how the Bible uses hope. The biblical word for hope is a assured confidence in a promised reality that is not yet possessed. Assured confidence in a promised reality that is not yet possessed. Notice how Paul describes it here. For in hope we have been saved, but hope that is seen is not hope. You see, it's not hope if I already have it, if I can already put my hands on it, if I I can already look at it. That's not hope. Hope is a confidence in something that's very real, something very guaranteed, can't be taken away, secured in heaven for us, but we don't yet see it. And so it has a future aspect. He goes on and says, for who hopes for what he already sees? But if we hope, verse 25, for what we do not see, which is what the Christian life is, we were saved in the realm, in the sphere of hope. Hope is alongside and with and around everything that the Christian life is all about. Why? Because we haven't set our affections on the things under the sun. God has rescued us from that that rat race and that hamster wheel that futility, that curse. We have our sights set on things beyond the sun, and we haven't seen them yet. We have them by faith, by confidence in what God has said. This is not wishful thinking. This is not pie-in-the-sky escapism. This is confidence produced by God, what God calls faith in the heart of a believer. I could never muster up something like this, but everyone who is in Christ has been implanted by this hope, has been embedded with this faith, this confidence, by the work of the Holy Spirit in the heart. And the critical aspect of hope is that we do not yet see what we hope for. This brings us to a fundamental definition of a Christian, seen at the bottom of verse 25. With perseverance, we wait eagerly for it. With perseverance, we wait eagerly. Why is perseverance required? Because waiting must happen over time. This hope, this trust in God, we could call it this, faith multiplied by time. That is, it perseveres, it it endures, it, it keeps going. You live your life here in a continual, constant, forward looking confidence 
with eager anticipation, with your ear down by the railroad tracks, is it coming yet? With your symphony of songs tuned into the symphony of the created order, craning its neck, looking around the bend, longing for your glorification, Christian. You join the universe in that song. This is what a Christian does. 1 Thessalonians 1 defines a Christian as those who have been rescued from idolatry and who wait for the return of Jesus. Jesus himself taught us to pray for the coming kingdom. Pray this, disciples. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. In other words, it's not here right now. But the Christian's heartbeat and longing and fundamental prayer is, God, let it come. I'm looking forward to it. And we long for the new heavens and the new earth, the eternal state. Described in Isaiah 25, that, that great banquet where God spreads out a lavish table for people from every tongue and tribe and nation and people. And God's people, God's children will say, this is our God for whom we have waited. This is the heartbeat of the people of God. And according to Romans 8.18, we long for our adoption, that is our resurrection, that glorification which makes any comparison to present sufferings not worth making. Let me ask you this. When your hot water heater floods your newly installed wood floors, what does your heart do? Oh, your heart groans because now I got to call the repair people and get a new hot water heater. But I hope your heart also groans along with the wood floor and along with the rusty bottom of your hot water heater in longing for your glorification. Did you know that's what your hot water heater was singing as the water was spilling out all over your new wood floors? Saying, I can't wait for you to look like Jesus. Here's some water. <laughs> Do broken things under the sun, ignite your hope in future glory? That's what they should do. Or do broken things in creation deflate your hopes, destroy your dreams, sour your outlook? I, I know they can. You see, these things reveal what we have set our affections on. They reveal what we prize. They tell us what our heart beats after. And listen, the world worships and serves the created thing rather than the creator. But not us. Our hope is set beyond the sun. Our hope is set to that glory that is to come. Let's pray. Oh God, would you let our hearts imitate creation's posture? Eagerly anticipating a new heavens and a new earth. Eagerly anticipating the revealing of the children of God, longing for that freedom which is brought about when your image bearers actually do what we were supposed to do, to reflect your character in the universe, to steward over created things with your heart, with your values, primarily with your glory, as our engine. God, you have given us hope. And that hope came at a very dark time, two millennia ago, when you took on flesh and came to a dark world. Light came into the darkness and the darkness did not recognize it, did not comprehend it. And the darkness even enveloped and murdered you when you came. And yet you are the hope for that darkness, the light for that darkness. And it is about you that we sing, not merely as a baby in Bethlehem, but as a Savior on a cross, dying to finish the work for all who believe, to cancel sin and bring us to you. May these things be our hope, in Jesus' name.